All right, welcome to the online causal inference seminar. Today, we are excited to have Eleanor Sanderson from the University of Bristol. We'll talk about estimation of causal effects on an exposure at multiple time points through multivariable Mendelian randomization. Uh, Eleanor will stop from time to time during her presentation, so please submit your questions via Q&A and we will bring uh, these questions to her. Um, after the talk, there will be a discussion by Stephen Burgess. Um, yeah, and as usual, if you participate in the, in the seminar, please keep in mind that the talk will be recorded. Uh, questions today will be handled by Emma, so I'm now switching over to her. Hi, everyone. Um, so as already mentioned by Dominic, please submit your questions to the Q&A. So not to the chat, but to the Q&A. Um, I will read out your questions to Eleanor, or uh, if we have enough time, for some of you, I will ask you to raise your hand and ask your question live. If you do so, please just keep in mind that the session is being recorded so that a uh, recording of your voice may end up uh, online later on. So that's all. I hope you enjoyed the talk and I'll give it over to Ellen. Hey, thank you very much. Um, let me just get my screen. Right. So hopefully you can see the presentation there now. Um, so yeah, as Emma and Dominic said, I'm going to be talking today about the estimation of causal effects of an exposure at multiple time points through multivariable Mendelian randomization. Um, and there's a quick overview, um, because I'm going to first talk about what is Mendelian randomization, um, and then what is multivariable MR. We always abbreviate Mendelian randomization because it's a bit of a mouthful to MR, so that's probably how I'll refer to it all the way through the talk. Um, and then go on to talk about uh, multivariable MR with time varying exposures and how we test instrument strength and sort of what the things we need to think about if we want to estimate so we're, um, these sort of models. And finally, um, look at an application of estimating the effect of childhood and adulthood BMI on a range of different outcomes. And I think maybe the first thing to sort of highlight at this point is I'm really thinking all the way through this where we've got a single exposure that might vary over your lifetime, a single outcome that will apply at some point in your lifetime. And we're trying to estimate what is the effect of that exposure at different time points in your life on that single outcome measured at one time point. Um, so we're not extending it beyond that. So there would be an application of the effect of childhood and adulthood BMI, we're saying, right, one of the things we look at is type 2 diabetes. We're saying, is there an effect of your BMI in childhood and your BMI in adulthood on type 2 diabetes in later life? And that's very much the structure of all of what I'm going to be talking about today is that sort of model. But going back more simply, sort of what is Mendelian randomization? It's so what Mendelian randomization is implemented is an instrumental variable estimation. So it can be thought of really as a form of IV estimation, but we use genetic variants as the instruments. And we can do this because those um, genetic variants are associated with phenotypes. Um, and because at conception, they're randomly allocated, which ones you get from your parents is sort of dependent on what your parents have, but within that it's random. So we can use that random variation in these genetic variants to test for and estimate the size of causal effects of lots of different exposures on outcomes. It obviously is limited to phenotypes on the person generally that are likely to be influenced by genetic variants, but it has a huge impact on like different health, primarily health research, because a lot of things are dependent on um, genetic variants to some level. Because it's a form of IV estimation, all of the standard IV assumptions apply. So we need to know that these genetic variants are actually associated with the exposure. We can, luckily, we can generally test that one. Um, but there also needs to be no confounding of the outcome and the genetic variants. That is generally satisfied because these genetic variants are predetermined at birth. 
And so we don't um, think that confounders that occur later in your life and affect the outcome and the exposure, can, they can't change the genetic variants, they're sort of predetermined. And also, of, we need to know that there's no or, um, hope that there's no effect of the instrument on the outcome that doesn't act through the exposure. Um, and that in a uh, sort of MR, when we're talking about genetic variants, is often referred to as pleiotropy. And that's pleiotropy is the concept that there's um, genetic variants might influence multiple different traits. And obviously, if you have pleiotropy, that is going to potentially violate your IV assumptions. So it's something that we talk and worry about quite a lot. Um, it can be implemented using either individual level data or summary level data. Um, the genetic variants we use are normally MIPS. What these are, single nucleotide polymorphisms. They are a single uh, base pair change on the genome. So very simply on your DNA is made up of millions of tiny little, uh, um, these tiny little SNPs, which can take one of four values and randomly across the population, there's lots of points where people might have one, two or two variants of that. And that is what we're looking at. So these are tiny little bits. They generally have very little um, influence. And we discover them through what's called a GUS or a genome-wide association study, where people will look at a particular phenotype, say BMI, and they will take maybe up to 500 thousand of these um, SNPs that are the ones that vary in the they're looking at and regress on that and that on oh, sorry on that um, phenotype and that will um, determine their uh, and that will give you an estimated effect of that um, variant on the phenotype. And the ones that are significant, once you've taken account of the fact that you've done 500,000 tests or whatever it is, so you have to account for multiple testing. Um, but once you've done that, anything that is really significant, you might take forward to be an instrument in your MR analysis. Um, if you have individual level data, that can be implemented then in a sort of standard two stage least squares um, using those genetic variants that you've identified from the GWAS. Um, and if you have summary level data, um, we, which is where the reason this comes about is those GWAS then can be published online. So you can have the SNP phenotype, so the estimated associations for all of those, that data set just available online for lots of phenotypes. So then the SNP sort of exposure association and the SNP outcome association um, and regress them on each other to get an estimate of um, the MR effect. And that gives you the, um, that will give you the MR effect. And actually, under some assumptions, um, individual level MR and summary level MR are sort of mathematically identical. So what we're estimating isn't changing. Multi, um, what is multivariable MR? Uh, it's quite simply um, where you have multiple exposures within the same phenotype, within, sorry, within the same analysis. Um, so we might have two, could be more generally limited to two, exposures that are associated with these genetic variants, and we can include them um, both in the same estimation. Um, but the reason multivariable MR is quite interesting and quite relevant here is that um, it estimates something slightly different. So it estimates the direct effect of each exposure conditional on the other exposures that you've included in your estimation. Um, but it, whereas MR will estimate the total effect of your exposure on your outcome. But equally, it can account for pleiotropy. So as I said at the beginning, um, pleiotropy is something that we really do worry about quite a lot in MR estimation. Um, there's lots of cases where we think that SNPs might be associated with multiple different traits. Um, and multivariable MR, if you, have, if you know what those traits might be, multivariable MR can give you causal effect estimates of each trait, even in the presence of that pleiotropy. So the example I have here is looking at sort of different types of cholesterol, HDL, LDL, and triglycerides on, i just put outcome because it could be, this is done for lots of different things, but we could say coronary heart disease or anything you want really, um, anything you might be interested in. But these three different traits don't have 
separately identifiable ge genetic variants. There's a huge amount of overlap in the genetic variants identified for each trait. So if we want to try and unpick the effect of say HDL on coronary heart disease, we can't just put that into a standard univariable MR because we'd be very worried. SNPs associated with HDL are also associated with LDL and triglycerides. And we can't unpick exactly which ones um, only affect HDL and don't violate that. Um, I think, or there may not be any, but don't violate that pleiotropy assumption. So we can put, but we can put all three of those traits into a multivariable MR and then estimate the causal effect of each trait conditional on the others on the outcome. Um, so it's quite a useful way of looking at things where you think this is strong pleiotropy in the model. Um, and as I said, we look uh, for multivariable MR is, um, can be also be done with summary level data. From now on, I'm only going to talk about summary level data, but everything sort of translates to individual level data. It's just that most frequently MR is applied with summary level data. So, and all the application I have in this is summary level data. So that's what I'm going to sort of focus on, but it does all translate sort of quite simply over to individual level data. Um, but if you have summary level data, then you can take the SNP outcome association for your full set, the set of SNPs that are associated with any of your exposures and regress it on the association of those SNPs with each exposure in a regression with no intercept. That equation isn't wrong. You do leave the intercept at, you fix the intercept to zero. Um, and that will give you the estimated causal effect of each of your exposures on your outcome, your MR estimate. Um, and it's weighted to account for the variation in the SNP um, outcome associations. Now, as in sort of standard IV estimation, uh, we need to think about what the assumptions are when we're doing a multivariable model. Um, these are for assumptions of multivariable MR, but again, they're the assumptions of any multivariable instrumental variable estimation. Um, your SNPs need to be associated with each of your exposures. But here it becomes a little bit different because they no longer need to just be associated with the exposure. They need to be associated with the exposure conditional on the other exposure that's been included in the regression. Um, they also I, need to Eleanor, be- Eleanor? Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm really sorry to interrupt. Uh, your, okay. uh, your audio video is cutting out from time to time. So okay. if you wouldn't mind just turning off your video, maybe that would make things better. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. No, it's fine. It's just there we go. <laughs> All right. Sorry um, about that. That's okay. <laughs> uh, so um, yeah, your instruments have to be um, independent of all confounders of any of the exposures and the outcome. And also, again, we need this assumption that there's no pleiotropic effect of those SNPs on the outcome that doesn't go via the um, exposures that are included in the model. Um, so the, as I said before, the instrument, the assumption of instrument strength in a multivariable model does become a little bit more complicated um, than when we're talk, thinking about a univariable IV estimation. Um, because This is because if we just looked at sort of standard um, F statistic, so standard associations that we might measure with a F statistic, um, your instruments can appear to be really strong, but actually be weakly associated with each exposure conditional on the others. Um, so for example, if in figures A and B here on this slide, we've got some genetic variants that are associated with the um, one of the exposures. Because the exposure then has an effect on the other exposure, um, it, they may appear to be strongly associated. So in A, you could find that your genetic variants or your SNPs appeared to be strongly associated with your with X2, but actually, if you try and put both of those in a multivariable IV estimation, you're going to get massive weak instrument bias, um, which wonderfully can bias everything in any direction in a multivariable model, which is um, not ideal. But um, 
And also equally, like those are A and B are quite extreme examples where we don't think we're probably going to get that sort of level of um, effect. But C in C, we could well have a model where the instruments look strong. They are associated with both exposures, but actually the correlation or direct effect between each of those exposures when you still have a weak instrument problem. And D is just an example of where everything would be fine, where you've got some genetic variants that affect each one independently. Um, but luckily we can test for this. Um, so we can test for instrument strength in a multivariable MR model um, by looking, sort of going one step back and taking, taking the, expo the outcome out of consideration completely, because the outcome doesn't actually matter for instrument strength, and saying, like, if we regress one of our exposures on the others, so here we've got a two exposure model, but pi two could easily be a vector of multiple exposures. Um, is there over identification in that regression? If there's more variation in that, more instruments in that regression, um, then we need to estimate that. That means there's enough to estimate all of the exposures in the model. And very simply, that's sort of what um, an F statistic does. It's the same, this is a sort of two sample version I put on the slides here, but the mechanism is the same in a one sample estimation. Um, so here we just test for um, over identification through a Q statistic for heterogeneity within that regression. Um, this, uh, um, the denominator is just has some extra terms to account for covariance between the exposures and uncertainty in the exposure associations. And actually this, if you divide this by the number of um, sort of number of instruments in this, the number of exposures in this first regression, uh, you actually get something that's actually mathematically equivalent to a univariable conditional, F, not univariable, uh, individual level conditional F statistic which means it can be compared to the standard weak instrument critical values. So we can use the rule of thumb of F is greater than 10. Um, and we can say, is this bigger or smaller than, um, or we could go and look at the actual critical values, but they are very close to 10. And we can say, so we can use that. So it's quite helpful that we can just say, have, compare this to very standard, well-established weak instrument testing um, critical values. So now, Finally, onto what I'm going to talk about. Uh, but we are, how does this all relate to using multiple time points in multivariable MR? So here we've got a model where we've got two time points, um, but we could have more. We have multiple genetic variants, and we'll use the standard multivariable MR testing, MR estimation that I've just been talking about, to estimate this model. But I think before that, I want to just talk a little bit about how we've set this up. Because we, what we're saying is we have these multiple genetic variants. They each have an effect on the exposure, but actually together they will affect a sort of underlying genetically predicted latent level of the exposure at any one time point. So you can think of X1 as being a influenced by L1, which is the collection of the effects of all of the SNPs on, on, L, on X1 at that time point. Plus X1 will also be influenced by confounders, other genetic influences. It'll be measured with error. It'll have all the things that about like your actual exposure, say BMI, and um, all the errors we know we get when we try and measure BMI. But then we're bringing this concept of the latent level of the exposure, which is yeah, taken together at one period, what is the effect of all the genetic variants on that period? And we think the latent value is something which will be influenced over a longer period of time. So your BMI, it won't vary by very much day to day, but it will vary day to day, month to month but your latent level is something that might vary over your lifetime, but it probably is something, you know, you'll have a latent level in childhood, you'll have a latent level in adolescence, you'd have a later level in later life, 
but we wouldn't expect it to vary on such a sort of day-to-day -day basis, very particularly. And um, importantly, uh, the reason we think, bring this in is we need to know that we can separate out the genetic effects on each period. So that's why we try and think about it in this way. We could have overlapping genetic variants like we have in the G2 in the two top example here. Um, but if we were in an example where we have like I have in B where we're actually all of our genetic variants, although we have X here measured at two different time points. So BMI say, but maybe you've got B, you're talking about BMI measured when you're 30 and BMI measured when you're 40. And in that case, we might think that actually we've got the same genetic influences going into those two BMI measures. They won't be the same, but the, the difference is all driven by confounding and um, environment and things. And actually the genetic influence over that time hasn't changed. Um, and we want to be able to, if we're going to try and estimate these models, we need to be able to distinguish that situation from the situation I put in A, where we have two different latent periods that we're considering. And that might be if we had BMI when you're 10 and BMI when you're 20. Now those still a 10 year age gap, but actually the genetic variants, we know this is, I, those are carefully picked because we know puberty actually has an influence on the genetic variants influence um, BMI. Um, but those two time periods are the same distance apart, but they might have quite like, we might be able to estimate that model when you're 10 and 20, and we wouldn't be able to estimate a model including say, yeah, 30 and 40 because they'd be too similar. But luckily we can test that using exactly the same um, weak instrument tests that we would use in any multivariable MR estimation. So firstly here, this is um, some simulations did where we've got um, a set of genetic variants that influence um, these latent variables for two different time periods. Um, the genetic variants are set up so that the correlation, the only things that influence L1 and L2 are this genetic variance, which I think is, I think it was about 150. It's 150. Um, so, but there's a correlation of 25% correlation between L1 and L2. They then influence X1 and X2, and X1 and X2 both have an influence on Y. Um, in blue, here is the direct effect of each model. Um, but those of you who are like paying a lot of attention will have noticed that the total effect on here doesn't actually, that I've put in red here, which is what we're trying to estimate from the MR estimation, um, isn't actually what this total effect would give. Um, and what I've done in this simulation is I've estimated the model with a univariable MR and a multivariable MR to get the um, to total effect and the direct effect. But the reason this total effect is not the same is because now that we're thinking about multiple time periods, actually in a univariable MR, this path, we don't just have the X1 to Y pathway and the X1, X2, Y pathway to take into account. We've got this, what you might call pleiotropy, but it's not, I don't know if pleiotropy is quite the right word because we know these genetic variants influence our exposure and so they're going to have an influence at another time point and we need to take that into account in when we work out our multivariable MR. So as well as the sort of standard, not sorry, work out the univariable MR total effect, as well as the standard bits that are going into that, we also need to sort of think back. So start at X1, go back to L1 and then go right if X1 is going to go up by a unit what, how much is X2 gonna be go up from the genetic variance? So for X1 to go up, L1 has to go up. And that means G12 is gonna go up. And that means that L2 is gonna go up and X2 is gonna go up. So we have this extra pathway from the genetic variance to the outcome, which in a normal sort of IV estimation, you would say, right, that's in a univer, if we're thinking about a univariable estimation of X1 or X1, Y, we think that that pathway from our instrument to the outcome doesn't go via the exposure we're interested in, 
that's just a violation of our IV assumptions. But we're never going to get around that violation of the IV assumptions because these are in this context, because they're relevant to what we're doing. And they are giving us this, um, what we're estimating really is not just the direct effect at X1, it's the total lifetime effect of having a unit higher exposure at the time X1 is measured. And that includes the time period that goes through the effect through another time period. Um, I don't know how well, I'll try again. But um, so we, that means we have this total effect, which is 0.34 and that is, here is the 0.2, the extra effect through X2 plus an extra effect from the genetic variance via X2 to the outcome. And that means our MR estimates aren't biased. And equally, the multivariable MR estimates give us an estimate of the direct effect at each time period conditional on the other, which in this model with there's only two time periods that matter is exactly the same as that sort of traditionally defined direct effect. Um, now I've estimated another model where we have one latent period. So that is, there's just one, this is the BMI where you've got measured at 30 and measured at 40 and you're trying to include them both in one estimation. If you look at the univariable MR estimate of the effect of um, X1, so BMI age 30 on your outcome, we have the increase in X1 of a unit and that has a, an effect, but we also have to take into account that these, this latent period is gonna have an effect through X2. And so we get a total effect that includes both of those. And in here, it seems a lot larger because of C, for X1 to go up by one genetically predicted increase by a unit, um, then that means that X2 has to as well. So that's why you get this quite large sort of doubling of the estimated effect. But if we try and estimate this with multivariable MR, we end up with um, quite large weak instrument bias. And it doesn't actually show up in the effect estimate here. You see that looking at that 0.207, it's not that different from 0.2. Too. But it, we actually, what happens in a multivariable MR like this, if you've got very weak instruments, is in the simulation, the bias goes in a random direction on each exposure at each um, uh, iteration of the simulation. So we get this sort of bimodal distribution, and then we get quite large absolute bias. If we to look at just how biased each estimate is, it's quite large. It's that on average, the bias comes back to zero, but every single iteration is quite biased. And these are shown by very weak conditional F statistics. Um, so now <laughs> my final simulation, um, we're talking about setting where we've got three time periods now. So say this is where we've got 10, 20 and 60, maybe three time periods that matter all with different underlying latent effects, but we're only gonna include two of them in the estimation. So now um, it's a slightly more complicated setup in that we've got an effect of our BMI age 10 on our outcome. There's an effect of BMI age 20 on our outcome. There's also an effect of BMI age 60 on our outcome. Um, the genetic variance for the first two periods affect all three. The third period has some extra genetic variance that just affect itself. And it, you see, I've got increasing co higher correlation between periods that are closer to each other and lower correlation between periods that are further apart. Um, and our MR gives us, um, so both our MR and multivariable MR give us sort of unbiased causal effects, but the bi each time the MR say of X1 is the effect of increasing X1 by a unit. So that's the direct effect plus the effect that increasing the genetic variance um, associated with X1 will have through other pathways at other time periods. Um, and then in the multivariable MR, we have uh, the effect, we've now only included X1 at X2 in the multivariable MR. So again, this means it's no longer, what we're estimating is no longer just the effect of X1 on the outcome conditional X2, well, that's what we're estimating, but there will still be a pathway that goes back from X1 through back through G2 um, and has an influence on X3. And that pathway, that sort of 
late underlying genetic, we could call it pleiotropy, I don't think that's the right word for it, will still um, be included in our estimation. It's part of the causal effect we're estimating. And what that means is that the direct, the sort of true direct effect is no longer exactly equal to these blue numbers on the slides. Um, and this is higher, the difference is higher for um, beta two, for X2, only because I put higher correlation between X2 and X3 in this simulation. There's nothing about that that's sort of true. It's just that it's, um, I modeled it so closer time periods were more highly correlated. Um, yeah, okay, so now I'm gonna sort of try and explain this in an application. So maybe if anyone has any questions, um, now would be a good time to stop for questions. So we don't have open questions in the Q&A now, but I definitely encourage people to submit questions and maybe we yeah. can come back to that. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about this, applying this to um, five different outcomes. <laughs> um, three of these are these oh, first. Sorry, actually, Eleanor, if you don't mind, I would have a short question uh, okay, if there's yeah, no sure. other. Could, uh, could you go back to the previous example, the pleiotropy thing? I, I'm just, maybe it's a naive question, but I'm just trying to understand. So when you say, um, for example, the total effect is 0.39 because of this additional path uh, yeah. through L1, G2, L3, X3. Yeah. So you are considering this to be kind of part of the causal effect, or yes. is this kind of something that just appears in the causal effect because you, are, um, you have to account for this path? So I'm no, I think that's a really good question. And we are, I think we are considering that to be part of the causal effect. I see. It's what we I think what we've been calling it is the sort of genetically predicted lifetime effect. Um, because we're using genetic variants to all do with this estimation, we're not gonna get at the causal effect at the time of X1. We're getting the causal effect of having those of increasing X1 due to you having those genetic variants and they have an effect at other time periods. So we're really incorporating that into the causal effect. Mm -hmm. We're saying that we have to, we have to think quite carefully about that and account for the fact that those um, things influence, yeah, have influences at different, um, my, some of the influence that you're estimating might be at a different time period to the time period that you're considering in your estimation. Mm -hmm. Okay, because yeah, so just looking at the graph, it, it doesn't look like part of the causal effect. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. No, it, I, yeah, it's, I think it's a, it's a slightly different way of thinking about it. Okay, all um, right. Yeah, so, okay, good, um, please continue. Yeah, so yes, we've got, uh, I've got five different outcomes here. Um, coronary heart disease, type two diabetes, breast cancer. These are all already published in this paper that I've got on the um, slide and two others, which are anorexia and smoking behavior. And we've included those because they're slightly more interesting. And we're looking at the effect of BMI. Um, well, I think the data we have is from UK Biobank. That was a sample of about 500,000 individuals from sort of nearish cities across the UK. Um, uh, they were all between 40 and 70 when they were recruited into the study. Um, and at an assessment center, they were genotype or blood was taken for genotyping, their BMI was measured. And they were also very <laughs> helpfully asked when they were 10 years old, compared to average, would you have described yourself as thinner, plumper, or about average? And this is just from the UK Biobank website, the sort of distribution of answers that we got from that question. Um, what we did, so I should, a full credit is like Tom Richardson did all of the actual analysis that I'm presenting here. So um, he should get full credit for that. Um, so he categorized BMI into three different categories to match the distribution of, because we had actual measured BMI, and match the distribution that we see in these um, slides, um, in this distribution. Um, ran a GWAS for both the sort of age 10 uh, GWAS and the older age, 
Um, and then the usual sort of caveats that this analysis was limited to white Europe individuals with white European ancestry who had observations for both ages. And we're not sort of addressing any challenges that that might arise in this um, rise because of that in this analysis. So this is a sort of what's called a Manhattan plot and a reverse Manhattan plot. So the top is the GWAS results. This is how they're often presented. This is the whole genome. Everything in gray is SNPs that don't have any sort of, well, some of them do have an effect, uh, but the, the height is the inverse log minus 10 P value. So basically the higher the line, the more associated that particular locus on the genome is with the trait that we're looking at. And we always, we tend to take sort of the top SNP each SNPs are so highly correlated in very, very small regions that you'll get these like clusters where they all have an effect and then you just take one out of that region. Um, and you can see, so the yellow lines are ones that are more associated in childhood and the blue ones more associated in adulthood. But as you can see, there's a lot of overlap. Um, so some of the ones that are more associated in childhood are still quite associated in adulthood. But there is a difference. So that's the sort of what this is showing is that we get different genetic effects in childhood and adulthood, but there is overlap between them. And then we ran a univariable MR estimation to estimate the effect of childhood adiposity and this multivariable to estimate the effect of childhood and adulthood adiposity. Um, the data was from a load of previous GWASs. We excluded UK Biobank. So um, in order to make sure that the these instruments, these SNPs weren't selected in the data set we were analyzing. And we tested that along with that graph, we, we tested that we could actually get um, separate genetic signals, separate strong instruments for each time period. Um, and these are the multivariable analysis F statistics um, show that we do actually get, they're not huge, but they are bigger than 10 and we are getting sort of strong instruments. Um, and these are our results for these three um, outcomes. For coronary heart disease, we see an effect in childhood in the univariable MR that then attenuates completely in, adult, in, in the multivariable MR and the effect in adulthood remains, implying there's just an effect in adulthood. Um, we get the same in type 2 diabetes. Um, interestingly for breast cancer, it seems to be that the effect childhood adiposity has a sort of persistent effect on the risk of breast cancer and there's no effect in adulthood. This is actually consistent with some results on how like puberty can affect your risk of breast cancer. So it's not actually a completely surprising result. Um, we then went on more recently to look at two other outcomes, um, anorexia and smoking behavior. Um, these are the two GWAS data we used for these. So we looked at anorexia and then smoking initiations, whether you've ever started smoking and whether you've stopped smoking. Um, and these are the results we get for these. So for anorexia, we get a um, positive effect of adiposity in childhood and a negative effect. So these are odds ratios because it's binary outcomes. So this is saying that adiposity in adulthood appears to be protective against anorexia. Um, for, and when we put these into a multivariable MR, actually the results get stronger. So we get a more strong, higher adiposity in childhood increases the risk of anorexia and a more protective effect in adulthood. And now clearly that, I, when I when we go back and look at the GWAS, most of the people in the GWAS develop anorexia in their teens. So saying that your BMI when you're 60 is gonna have a causal effect on anorexia when you're um, in your teens is like, that doesn't really make any sense. Um, so what we actually think is that probably what's going on, and this would need more investigation, is that childhood adiposity does increase your risk of anorexia, but maybe there's a protective effect of adolescent an um, adiposity on the risk of developing anorexia. And the genetic variant variants associated with um, adolescent adiposity are actually very highly correlated with adulthood adiposity. And that is why we're seeing this effect because what, although we're trying to estimate an adult to anorexia effect, we're picking up the adolescent to anorexia effect. And that 
the causal effect that we're estimating is not the effect of BMI when you're between 40 and 70, it's the effect of BMI in adulthood overall, and we can't define exactly when that time is. And smoking, we get a very similar result, I and mean, slightly different in the fact that the univariable MR shows a, um, a sort of negative effect in childhood and a negative effect in adulthood. Um, but when we look in the multivariable estimation, the childhood effect disappears completely. There's no association between childhood BMI and um, smoking but, or smoking initiation, but the um, adulthood effect doesn't. But again, smoking is not something people tend to take up when they're 50. It's something people tend to take up when they're 20. And um, again, we think that maybe what we're getting is this effect and that we can't actually distinguish that period with this data. And in order to be able to unpick whether what we hypothesize is actually happening in these results is happening, we would need more time periods. So we'd need to have um, a measure of BMI at various different time periods to know that we could unpick them using genetic variants, so test that, and then we could try and unpick at what time period after age 10 BMI affects smoking. But that from this data, all we can say is that, that some period after your 10 and um, over your life, your BMI does have a causal effect on your smoking behavior. Um, and thank you. This is um, thank you to all the these are all the people I've collaborated with on various aspects of this work. And these are the references for the papers that are published that are I've sort of covered at least a little bit in this talk. Thank you. Thanks, Eleanor. Uh, we do have some questions. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'm putting Eric on the spot, but uh, there's a question from Eric Chetkin. Chetkin, do you want to ask your question live if I I will let you talk and then if you feel comfortable please feel free to yeah. uh, can you hear me yes we can yeah. thank you thanks Eleanor for a really nice presentation so my, my question goes back to the DAGs that you presented um, particularly for temporally ordered exposures um, mm -hmm. because they, they suggested that you were ruling out any time variant confounding so for instance BMI when you're a teenager may causally impact how much you actually exercise and work out when you're a young adult, which in turn may confound the causal effect of BMI when you're older on, let's say, heart disease. Um, yeah. It's unclear to me that uh, multivariate, or under what condition is multivariate MR deals with this problem, which we know is a real problem in observational studies. Can you please comment on that? Um, yeah, so we, because we're just, we are using genetic variants that are fixed at conception to identify these effects. Any sort of time varying confounding, I think would fall into the confounding estimates of the estimates that we, so we wouldn't be too concerned about it. Um, reverse causation from the outcome to um, the later exposure. So if that confound, like, I don't know, even if it's then confounding, if you think your outcome does have an effect on your exposure at later time periods is possibly a concern. But as long as we don't think our genetic variants influence the time varying confounder or the outcome directly, so that assumption still has to be satisfied, then I think time varying confounding isn't something we're too concerned about because we're looking at the influence estimated through genetic effects that are fixed. They, they might have different effects at different time periods, but they're, they're sort of, they're fixed. What they are is fixed at when you're born. Uh, okay. could, I, could, could I ask you please to, to go back to the pleiotropy uh, example? I'm sorry to, to be so um, annoying with that. I just mm -hmm. wanted to make sure I understood kind of also Eric's question as well. Mm -hmm. So here, I think, for me, I would think if this is your kind of causal graph of interest, I would think that kind of controlling for G2 would uh, exclude this extra causal part or uh, this extra part that you have in the total effect. So I think, and maybe Eric can um, 
you can correct me if I'm wrong, but are you asking whether L1 and L2 and L3 could be connected directly? Because that was, would be my, it seems to be that you're excluding the option that L1 and L2 and L3 are directly connected somehow. Um, that may be, actually, if you go back maybe one slide where you have the DAG with the U, yeah. So what I'm really asking is, um, there, there may be some U's that occur after X1. So in this case, I was taking exercises. Mm -hmm. exercising. So X1 is a cause of that U. Yeah. Um, and that U is a common cause of, let's say, X2 and X3 and Y. And so that's the setting in which we know standard methods kind of break down. You have to use G methods. And yeah. IV for G methods are incredibly, can be incredibly complicated. And usually, um, so I, I guess I was just asking whether it's obvious that this takes care of it. It's still not obvious that it does, but. I, I don't think it is because in that case, it might become causal part of the, you might think of it as part of the causal pathway. So if you, you don't I, think it's a problem or you don't think it takes care of it? I don't think it takes care of it. And I don't think that's necessarily a problem. I don't think that with many of these examples, when we're thinking about say your know, BMI on maybe BMI, yeah, but BMI on um, type two diabetes or whatever, the, all of that, that's probably a really bad example for this, but I don't think that we think all of that is direct. And it may be that some of it is BMI affects how much you exercise and that affects your outcome. And that is part of your causal effect that you're estimating. And if it has a sort of feedback, I still think that wouldn't be a problem. In okay. that, in this case. All right. Okay, then I, I think maybe uh, we should continue on with the discussion. Eleanor, there are some other questions in the Q and A that feel free to answer during the discussion uh, via chat if you if you feel comfortable. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, Stephen, please. Uh, great. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm going to discuss some of the um, topics which have been brought up by, by Eleanor in that um, really interesting talk. Um, I think just to give a quick kind of summary as to how do I understand Mendelian randomization. Um, so as, as Eleanor said, it's a, it's a widely applicable technique. It's a technique that can be performed using um, data which are, are publicly available. Um, it's a technique which compares genetically defined subgroups of the population with different average levels of the, the putative causal factor. Um, for me, it's valuable in terms of providing evidence about the existence or, or non-existence of a causal relationship. Um, obviously, that's based on untestable assumptions, as, as any causal method is. Um, in some cases, these are, these are plausible and in other cases, these are less plausible. Um, but I think some of the questions from Eric and others in, in the chat um, are more questions about the interpretation of, of estimates from this method. And I think when we're using this as a method to actually estimate quantitative um, quantities, both quant quantities which we're gonna give a, um, an interpretation to, um, and in terms of what we think might have a, a real world interpretation, that this is slightly more questionable, that the genes change exposure in a way which we can't necessarily provide an intervention which, which exactly mimics. Um, and so while I think this approach is, is interesting, and I think that there are things that we can learn from this, um, I think I'm also slightly concerned that this way of applying Mendelian randomization really focuses on, on causal estimation rather than causal hypothesis testing. Um, and just to give an example of this, um, thinking about model misspecification, um, I'm gonna put a few equations up, hopefully not that many, because this is PowerPoint and, and it's, uh, yeah, difficult to put equations in PowerPoint, but, but I'm, I'm going to model an exposure variable, which I'm gonna call X. I'm gonna say this, this exposure variable varies over time. Um, I've got here 30 genetic variants, which are my instruments. And um, these have kind of direct effects, alpha one J, 
um, this fine varying effect alpha 2j, which varies depending on our cosine. So we've got some, some wiggling going on there. So that, that gives us the identification. Um, and these wiggles, they all have the same period, but they start at different points. So there's some offsetness there. Um, there's a confounder, which is u, and there's some error terms. Um, and if we think about the outcome here, I'm, I'm going to think that this outcome is just defined based on the values of, of x at time 10 and at time 50. So it's a very simple outcome. It's affected by um, kind of childhood levels of, of x and, and adulthood levels of x, if you want to think of 10 as 10 and 50 as being measured in years. Um, so the, the causal parameters that we might be trying to estimate here are 0.4 and then minus 0.8. As I said, there's some confounding going on um, and the effect of these genetic variants, which we're um, which are valid instruments in, in the simulation. Um, these, these vary over time. So I'm going to use two stage least squares, which um, for those who know is it's quite an established method um, with individual level data. So if we measure X truly at the time points 10 and 50, which are the times when the causal effect um, operates, then we get roughly the right answer. We can see these box plots here. The box plot at the bottom is centered at plus 0.4. The box plot at the top is centered at about minus 0.8. If we took x not just at two time points, but at three time points at age 10, 30, 50, we can still that we still get see that we still get the right answer. Our model is still correctly specified. If we take x at time points 10, 40, uh, 10, 20, and 50, 10, 40, and 50, we, we still get the right answer. But what would happen if instead of taking x at time points 10 and 50, if we took it at time points 20 and 40? So we're still looking at a value in early life, we're still looking at a value in later life, what's going to happen? Um, and the answer is actually our, our estimates are, are both broadly negative, um, and the estimate in, in earlier life is, is actually smaller than the estimate in later life. So our, our estimates are, are completely wrong here, they're, they're, they're completely different both quantitatively and, and qualitatively based on what the true, the true values of these parameters are. And why might this be a problem? Well, if we, we think about the, the famous story of, of Achilles and the tortoise, um, so Achilles here and we've got a tortoise um, that they took part in a race, um, Achilles being a good sport, he gave the tortoise a head start. And of course, Achilles quickly ran to where the tortoise was, but by that time the tortoise had, had moved forward slightly. And then Achilles keeps running and he moves to where the tortoise is now and, and the tortoise moves forward and, and this continues. And, and we know that obviously Achilles never overtakes the tortoise, um, except that we know that's, that's not true. And, and the reason that's not true is that time is, is not discrete, time is, is continuous. And my concern is that the models that we build using the values of the exposure at fixed time points our models will always be misspecified. Um, if you want to talk in the language of instrumental variables, the, the exclusion restriction assumption will, will always be violated. And the question is, are estimates from this, um, from this technique going to be reliable? So when we think about the exclusion restriction assumption, if we think about the classic directed acyclic graph, is it plausible that if the exposure influences the outcome, in a continuous way over time, in a cumulative way, in the way that we think quite a lot of biological variables will affect. You know, it, it's not that suddenly if you changed somebody's BMI at, at age 50, then, then magically all of the effect of, of being obese at age 50 wouldn't, wouldn't have any previous effect. Um, so we, we might expect that these specific values of the exposure that we've measured don't explain the totality of the relationship between the instrument and the outcome. So just in summary, I think Mendelian randomization is really valuable for testing evidence for a causal relationship. Even in straightforward examples, the interpretation of estimates is, is not straightforward. Um, and I'd, I'd want to give caution in, in using methods that, that apply this approach in a way that relies on the interpretation and comparison with numerical estimates. Um, quick shout out to Haodong Chang, who's my PhD student, who's
working on some of these problems and, and we, we, we don't think this is a complete loss. We, we think that there are some, some ways in which we can interpret these, but I think that some, some portion, some, some care is needed. Thanks for listening. All right, uh, thanks for the nice discussion, uh, Stephen. Um, Eleanor, do you wanna, if you want, you can quickly respond um, if you want. Um, yeah, thank you. I think the only thing um, that, yeah, Stephen's quite right that I have been, we haven't thought about continuous time. We've been thinking about this as very much like variants having an effect on a time period, but also um, that maybe, from the way I've been thinking about it, the violation of the exclusion restriction is not so much of an issue because we're taking that pathway into account in our causal effect estimates. And that does mean you can't identify which period it is that matters, even if you've measured your exposure at a certain time period. Because, and that is, I think that's the same problem we're thinking about, but just in a sort of slightly different way of thinking about it. That because the time because it's um you yeah that because of that exclusion restriction violation you can't say that this effect we've estimated happens at the time that we've measured the exposure or the outcome just that it happens at some period between when we last include a measure of the exposure and we next include a measure of exposure in the multivariable estimation All right. Okay, thanks. So I think uh, can now quickly uh, wrap up. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Eleanor, for a, a very interesting talk and Stephen for a very nice uh, discussion. Uh, next week, we're going to have uh, Colin Fogarty from MIT who will talk about pre-pivoting in finite population causal inference. Thank you all for coming and participating. Hope you have a great week and uh, see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>